grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from Philippians chapter 3, where Paul is reminding us of what's really important in life. We begin at verse 4. If someone thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith our text. There are many things in our lives that we would consider important. For example, things like our homes and our cars, those are important. Food and clothing, things like that. Family, friends, they're important. For some people, technology items are very important, such as their iPhones and computers and TVs and video games. For others, more natural things like flowers and trees and yards and gardens are very important. My wife and I fall more into that category. Toys can be important for a lot of people, people of all ages. And those toys can include anything from dolls and toy trucks and bicycles to motorcycles and jet skis and boats. But if we ask ourselves the questions, what really counts and what is really most important, we would have to admit that many of these so-called important things that we think we couldn't live without, we actually could. For example, we could live without all of our toys. I mean, maybe life wouldn't be quite as much fun, but we could live without all of our toys. I'm old enough that it's actually possible to live without a cell phone and computers and video games. People older than me lived without cars. They survived. You know, we could even live without our houses and without our friends and family if we had to. Life would certainly be more challenging, be a lot less enjoyable not having all those things, but we could survive. But there's one essential that we could never live without. And that's what St. Paul is talking about here in our text. He's answering this big question, what really counts? What is it that is absolutely priceless that we could never live without? Here's what he says. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish or garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Compared to knowing Jesus Christ and being found in him, Paul says that everything else is rubbish or garbage. I've never been a real scholar of Greek, but I've always found that Greek word for rubbish to be very interesting. The Greek word for rubbish is skubala, S-K-U-B-A-L-A, skubala. It doesn't only mean rubbish or garbage. It means something worse than that. It actually means Doesn't the word even sound gross when you say it? I mean, scubala. 
Well, Paul is putting everything in proper perspective here. And he's telling us that everything in this world, everything that we so often think is so valuable, is actually scubala, manure, compared to knowing Christ and being found in him. So what does it mean to know Christ and to be found in him? Those are relationship words and phrases. To know Christ means not just to know him up here, but to be involved in an intimate relationship with him. And to be found in him means that we are abiding in him, as Jesus asked us to do. If a man remains or abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's this idea of being so close to Jesus that he is our only source of life and power. It's vitally important that we what Paul is saying here. He is saying that the most important thing about being a Christian, being a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, the most important thing is our relationship with him. It's not what we do that's most important. It's who we are. So who are we? Knowing our identity is vital in knowing Christ and being found in him. Well, in these opening verses that I read here from Philippians 3, Paul makes a confession. He admits that he used to find his identity in his ancestry and his accomplishments. And then he tells us that if anybody should have been able to stand before God feeling good about himself, it was him. He had an ancestry that was first class. He was a full-blooded Israelite. He came from the tribe of Benjamin, according to the law, a Hebrew of Hebrew, foreign blood in his veins. And at that fact, he was a Pharisee one of the highest classes of Jews. And he obeyed all the laws of the Pharisees perfectly. So he could certainly stand before God and feel really good about himself. Oh yeah, in addition, he adds here, he also persecuted Christians, which the Pharisees thought would add an extra jewel in your crown. But what does Paul say now? All of that is a loss. None of that counts anymore, why? Because by knowing Christ, he has found his true identity. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul admits who he really is. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. He no longer found his identity in his, all of his accomplishments. He now knew through Jesus Christ that he was a sinner. But he also knew that his true identity came from knowing Christ and being in a relationship with him. He knew that he was a dearly loved child of God. Not because of anything he had done. Jesus Christ had done for him. The lesson here for us is this. Finding our identity in what we do, scubala. Finding our identity in what Jesus Christ has done for us, priceless. And so what has he done for us? Well, Paul puts it this way. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. To clearly understand this, we really need to understand righteousness. Righteousness simply means to be right with God, right in God's eyes. So if I stand before God and I start telling him, you know, God, I hope you've noticed how good I am. I don't curse or swear very much. I go to church a lot. I'm a good dad. I'm a good parent. I'm a good citizen. I work hard at my job. If I do that kind of thing before God and I expect him to say, yeah, you're right. Now you're right with me because of all this good stuff you've done. I'm going to be in for a shock. Because what will God tell me or any one of us who does that? He may say, yeah, you might be good. You might even be better than some other people. 
but you are not perfect in all your actions, words, thoughts, and desires. And that's what I demand, so I'm going to have to punish you. God's word makes it very clear that our own efforts are never good enough to make us righteous. By our own work, even with all of our accomplishments, we're never going to be right in God's eyes because we cannot be perfect. So even if we have a really good day, we think, boy, you know, it was great today. I only had one bad thought, but we still fail to meet God's demands. And in his justified anger over our sin, he will strike us down. Here's the key. If I stand behind the cross, that is, when I put my faith in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, and I admit to God that I am a sinner, I can never make myself righteous, but instead I trust that Jesus Christ has taken my place. I have faith that his perfect life counts for me and that his death on the cross gives me forgiveness. Then I am saved. Then I am right with God. Why? Because Jesus stands between me and the Father. The Father's here, Jesus, then me. And as long as stand in Jesus, the anger that, my, that the Father has over our sin gets directed at Jesus Christ. He strikes his own son, Jesus, who suffers all the punishment I deserve saved from God's anger. God declares me righteous, and I have eternal life with him because of Christ. That only happens when I trust in Jesus. So here's another lesson for us. Having a righteousness of my own through my own good works, scubala. Knowing that I am forgiven and made righteous through faith in Jesus Christ, priceless. Knowing who I am as God's dearly loved child and being right with him by trusting Jesus Christ, then I can enjoy this relationship with God that is priceless. And it's that relationship that really counts. Out, where this is what will last for all eternity. And yet, if you're anything like me or any other ordinary Christian, I think, it's difficult to stay focused on our relationship with God. Rather than being found in Christ and abiding in Him, we're often involved in other more important things that draw us away from him. I firmly believe that the primary job that we have as Christians is not being a Christian, although that's a challenge. I believe the biggest challenge is keeping our relationship with him growing. The more we focus on that, and the stronger our abiding in Christ becomes, the more of his love and power we will have in our lives so that we can then live as Christians. Where do you want Jesus to find you when he returns as judge of the world? Lost in all the things of this world, playing around in all the scubala, or living in a relationship with him, closely and safely tied to him by faith, or tied to this world? Being found in him is what really counts. Losing ourselves in the things of this world is scubala. Let's relate all this to our everyday lives. What Paul is saying is we're going to have peace and joy only in our lives, peace and joy in our lives only if we know the difference between scubala and what is truly valuable. Now, sometimes scubala is very easy to identify. We pretty well know that such things as abusing drugs or alcohol, sexual permissiveness, any kind of abuse or pornography or murder or stealing, all those things are scubala. They're manure. We always want to stay away from those things. But what about the more subtle things? 
some of the things that are actually scubala may not be wrong in themselves, but if we lose ourselves in those things, or if we try to gain credit before God and make ourselves look good by doing certain things, then we are fools. We're only fooling ourselves. It's not going to work. So only if we know the difference between scubala and what God says is truly valuable, and we go after what's valuable, only then will our lives be filled with his peace and his joy. So let me list a whole bunch of stuff and see if you can distinguish the difference between scubala, manure, and what's priceless. You can answer these to yourself. Here we go. A beautiful million dollar house, scubala. A home in heaven, priceless. A long list of my accomplishments, scubala. What Jesus Christ has done for me, priceless. Being in a position of power and authority over others, scubala. Being a servant of Jesus Christ, priceless. Being popular, having lots of friends, having Jesus as my friend and savior and brother, priceless. Here's a tough one. Winning $100 million in the lottery, <laughs> scubala. And for myself, scubala. Lose priceless. Driving a really fancy, expensive car, scubala. Priced, priceless. Spending lots of time pursuing my own interests, scubala. Spending lots of time. earth, scubala. Having it all in heaven someday, priceless. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we have wisdom to always know the difference between scubala and what is priceless. By the power of your Spirit, keep us focused on you so that every day we may be found